So continuing our story here, getting into 10.4. So yesterday we saw about the code. Earlier we talked about DNA. We, of course, talked about DNA replication. We've talked about transcription going to the messenger RNA and how the messenger RNA gets edited at the end. We've talked about going from messenger RNA or transcript to our protein. And yesterday we talked about this code that works to do that, right? And the ribosome is going to help to read the code. And we're going to actually assemble our amino acid sequence. But what we're going to talk about today is this idea down here that we're taking this transfer RNA. It's the transfer RNA that's bringing the amino acids to the ribosome, right? It's getting charged with the amino acids. And that's what's going to bring the amino acids in the right spot, in the right order, to make the primary sequence of our protein. Right? Of course, the primary sequence is going to determine how this thing folds, and it's the folding of a protein that's going to give it the function. And so we want to see the second half of this translation idea over the next couple slides. And so, here is our transfer RNA that's going to bring our amino acids. So as you read about for today, first of all, the transfer RNA kind of has what's described as a clover leaf shape. It kind of also has a little bit of a T shape to it. Um, and so in this clover leaf structure, now remember it's not quite as simple as that, right? This shows you a little bit more of the complexity of it. But it is RNA, right? So it does have A's and U's and C's and G's. And on the end, the clover end of it, it has this anticodon. And the anticodon is going to be complementary to the codon on the messenger RNA, right? And so we can see, notice at the bottom, there's basically three bases that fit nicely along the bottom. And so we're going to have this triplet code again. And on the other end, the three prime end, we are going to have the amino acid attached. And so again, you can see that kind of almost forms this hairpin shape, right? It goes down and back up. It's the three prime end that has this extra attachment or these extra couple bases where our amino acid is going to be able to come in and our amino acid will be held there. And we'll talk about how that works in a second. All right? So we got this, basically, this transporter coming in with our amino acids. And as we've talked about yesterday, We've got 61 different codons. We only have 20 different amino acids. And so there's that wobble, right, allowing the same transfer RNA might be able to carry a couple different amino acids, right, especially ones that the first two bases are the same. And then it's able to still, even though that third base might differ a little bit, still able to carry it in. So there are not 61 different transfer RNAs. Now, there is an enzyme that helps with this, aminoacyl transfer RNA synthetase. Right, a little bit of a mouthful there. But ultimately, we just need to know this as the enzyme that's going to allow the amino acid to bond, to form a bond with the transfer RNA. Right? Because it's got to be bound together. And so here's our little transfer RNA. And what we're going to do is, this is our uh, enzyme, this big kind of purplish rectangle thing. And it's going to allow this bond to form so that our amino acid gets hooked on to the end of our transfer RNA. Of course, the anticodon is down on the bottom. So when they transfer RNA's anticodon pairs with messenger RNA's codon, you have this amino acid kind of hanging off on the top. Now, this bond requires energy, right? So it takes energy. You have to invest energy to do that. And you remember where that energy came from? Okay. ATP, good. And so ATP, right, we break the phosphates off. That energy is used to make this bond in that coupling idea that we learned back in chapter 6. Well, it turns out that we can make this bond, but this bond is unstable. Remember ATP's bond is a little bit unstable too, right? Kind of like a loaded spring. Well, this bond right here is unstable as well, which is a good thing because if this bond's unstable, it's stable enough to allow the transfer RNA to bring it over to the messenger RNA in the ribosome, right? But by being unstable, it's fairly easy for it to get released at the ribosome site, right? And now we have this amino acid that needs to get connected to what? What are we making? Protein. It's got to get connected to another amino acid, right? We got to form a peptide bond or polypeptide bond, right? And so the energy for that is going to come from, well, this unstable bond is going to get broken. It's going to release energy. And we can use that energy to make this peptide bond between our growing chain of amino acids. Okay? And so again, you got to always ask yourself, where is, the in, where is this energy coming from to actually do these processes? Right? So the amino acid is released easily at the ribosome because it's unstable. That powers our primary structure coming up. And so we have this idea of a ribosome, which is actually a pretty complex structure. Um, it facilitates or helps the transfer RNA 
anticodon to bind with a messenger RNA's codon, right? It's going to help that base pairing idea. Now, remember, we've talked about other things that help with base pairing, right? DNA polymerase is helping with DNA replication. You've got RNA polymerase helping to pair up nucleotides and messenger RNA um, transcription. So when we kind of think about this ribosome, well, it's helpfully, helping to put these things together. So it's almost a fuzzy idea of what this thing should actually be considered. Kind of back in our cell chapter, we talked about it being an organelle. On the other hand, it's actually somewhat acting like an enzyme too, right? It's matching these things up, just like some of those other enzymes we did. And that's not too surprising, really, because what's ribosome made out of? Two things. Protein and RNA. Protein, which is also what enzymes are, right? And ribosomal RNA. And so it kind of makes sense that, yeah, we consider it organelle, but it also is kind of acting as this enzyme to get things to work. Now, it turns out there's also two structures to an enzyme, or sorry, to a ribosome. There's the large subunit, because it's larger, and there's the small subunit, named because it's smaller. And so, as we have these two subunits, um, it actually is a little bit uh, more complex even. If you read carefully in your notes, which one binds the messenger RNA first? The small one. The small one, good. What actually happens is the small subunit binds to the messenger RNA. You've got some transcription factors, right? Remember those get going on and bind on as well. Um, or translation factors, it binds on. Then it actually, the small ribosome starts to move down until it finds that starter code. Remember AUG, right? Finds AUG, and at that point, so you got this almost this messenger RNA kind of running through your small subunit like this, right? It's kind of feeding through. At that point, when it finds that first codon, now the large unit kind of clamps on top and holds it in place, and that stays in place and that moves down. It's not the messenger RNA that's moving through. It's moving across the messenger RNA, right? And it's going to do that until it reaches one of those three stop codons, which is going to cause it to unassemble and allow the messenger RNA to be released from that ribosome as well. So it's a pretty complex little structure. And so we also have three different sites in this ribosome, three different positions for transfer RNAs. And that's where we got into that A, that P, and that E that I mentioned yesterday, but you guys hadn't read about it yet. And so first of all, we can see the three sites in here. Which one is the transfer RNA docked in right now? The P. The P is the middle site. And so you have the A site. The first amino acid, by the way, that comes in, it docks in the P right away. All right, it's docked in the first site. Notice methionine. So we have AUG down here. AUG is our codon, of course, complementary for the transfer RNA. And so the first one comes into the A site carrying the messenger amino acid. Now, after that, all additional transfer RNAs come into the A site. Holds the transfer RNA carrying the next amino acid to the chain coming in. The P site is where we're actually going to start to assemble our polypeptide chain. We don't really call it a protein, because proteins have three-dimensional structures and maybe even multiple chains hooked together, right? So at this point, we're just building a sequence of amino acids, so it's usually referred to as just a polypeptide chain. And so that's where the P site is. And so in other words, the P site is going to be kind of holding our chain that we'll see is getting longer and longer and longer as the A site keeps accepting new transfer RNAs. So obviously something's got to be shifting, right? The ribosome is shifting so that it's keeping that A site continually open so that more and more transfer RNAs can bind. And then finally we have the E site, stands for exit, and that's where the empty transfer RNA leaves the ribosome. So basically, we have an A site right here, right? So now another amino acid is going to come, and another transfer RNA carrying another amino acid is going to bind. Then what direction is my ribosome going to shift, left or right? It's going to go right, because that will put my original one into my E site. That will put my second transfer RNA, which we don't see yet, into my P site, and the amino acid will be transferred to that, so it'll actually have two amino acids on it, and that'll leave the A site open, so that now, it can read my NIXT codon and bring in another transfer RNA. Then it's going to shift and it's going to eject that NIXT transfer RNA, leaving the P site with three amino acids, leaving the A site open so another transfer RNA can come in. And again, it's moving this way, so it's reading these codons, three bases at a time, heading on the messenger RNA from 5' prime to 3'. Prime. So here's maybe a little bit of a better picture of that. So we first of all have three steps. We start with the initiation, where we bind or we bring the messenger RNA 
the ribosome subunits and what's called the initiator transfer RNA, that first one together. And so we can, well, I guess we can kind of see that over here on the left picture, right? So here's our initiation. We've got our original transfer RNA with methionine. It's coming into the P site, right? We've got our messenger RNA. We've got um, our ribosome subunits. First the small one, then the big one comes in. Then once we kind of have everything bound together in the right spot, the transfer RNAs, the messenger RNAs, the ribosome, now we start elongation, right? We're just elongating. We're just making the polypeptide chain longer, right? And so now we're going to add those amino acids based on the codon sequence, right? You see the second one coming in into the A site. So here, now we got our first two amino acids in. Now what's going to happen is we're going to make a bond. I don't really like that picture. We'll go to this one. The messenger RNA is going to shift, or the ribosome is going to shift. Notice how the P site's holding our protein, right? Our polypeptide chain. Our first transfer RNA is sitting in the E site. It's going to get ejected here. Notice our A site's open. Our first, our first transfer RNA gets ejected, right? Uh, another amino acid comes in, or sorry, another transfer RNA carrying another amino acid comes in, and that happens over and over again. And you can see again our P site's holding this polypeptide chain that we're making. And way over here at the end, dangling off, is methionine, right? The first amino acid we brought in. We said yesterday that's the end terminus of the protein. The amino group of that methionine is sticking out that direction. Then finally, it's going to get to a code, a stop codon, and it's going to say, okay, here's the end of my transcript. Here's the end of my amino acid chain. And it's going to allow these things to kind of uh, <coughs> break off. And that's our termination. And now we have the protein, which might get shipped somewhere and can now take on its three-dimensional structures. And now that, that messenger RNA, we'll talk more about this in chapter 11, but that messenger RNA might bind to another ribosome. The same transcript, we only made it once, but now it could bind to another ribosome and do the same thing, and then another, then another, then another. And I think you even read about it in your book about how you can have one messenger RNA with a whole bunch of ribosomes reading at the same time, right? Almost looks like a pearl necklace. And so you're taking one transcript, and really, really quickly, if you're transcribing it several times at the same time, you're going to make a whole lot of protein product, which might be an enzyme, right? And so your body says, hey, I need this enzyme, and it's able to make it very, very quick, right? Because of that idea of being able to read it, or being able to have more than one ribosome at a time on there. So it's the mRNA that's... MRNA that's Moving, not the ribosome? No, the ribo I would picture the mRNA as staying still. It's the ribosome, the purple guy, that's, that's shifting. shifting this direction three bases at a time. Okay. Yeah. So finally, your book went into a little bit more detail about this, and we're not going to at this point, but your protein is probably going to have to receive a signal because you're making this protein, right? And it's got to be sent to wherever it's needed. And so... You can see that we're making this polypeptide chain over here on the left. We're going to add this orange signal recognition, recognition particle to it. It just so happens that we have a, um, we have a little uh, complex, basically a receptor there. Notice it's the endoplasm reticulum. And if it has that, it's allowed to enter into that. The protein is, right? Not the whole amino acid thing. And so it basically is sending our protein into the ER. And we learned back in the cell chapter that the ER modifies and kind of changes your protein and then passes on to the Golgi and then maybe ships it somewhere else in the body, right? And so it allows this protein to get packaged to ship it to where it's going to be needed. Now, if the, anyone catches if the, the polypeptide chain you're making does not get a signal put on it, what happens to it? it stays in whatever compartment made it. Right, so wherever it was just made is where it stays. Okay, so again, because even right locally, you're going to need enzymes and structural proteins and things like that, right? So basically, it covers our basis to say, well, we can use this protein, or we can get it to wherever we're actually going to need it.